Cassie, before I decide anything, let's see it one more time. From the beginning? No, no, no. From where he says, you've solved many of the problems. Line after, those are determined. Mm, that part. And in effect, you've solved beforehand many of the problems that look insuperable. And consequently, by isolating the particular problems of expository versus persuasive versus literary and versus expressive writing, many, many, many of the little smaller problems, especially of vocabulary and syntax, just fall into place. They have to. Hold it. Stop it there. Oh, Cassie. This is just not going to work. I can't possibly open the show like this. But I thought Norm had already decided on this for the opening. Mm-hmm. But tell me, is it clear to you what Dr. Canavy says here? Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure of some of the terms. Expository, persuasive, uh, literary. Exactly. Um, if we just throw this interview up on the screen without any explanation, our students aren't going to be sure either. Then we shouldn't use this interview. Oh, no, no, no. That's not what I mean. What Dr. Canavy says here about audience and purpose is too important to be left off. It's a matter of how we incorporate it into the script. I'm sure you'll find a way. <laughs> oh, well, Norman is the problem. We haven't used the scenes he wrote for the last script, and I've had to cut out some of his jokes, and now he's writing a skit which I know is not going to work. But he is a good writer. Oh, right? yes, yes, one of the best I've ever worked with. But for several years now, he's been writing advertising. But now, for some reason, he's having a great deal of trouble coming to terms with the instructional elements of these programs. What do you mean? Well, in this program, we must show that awareness of audience and purpose is essential for a writer. And Norm's ideas so far don't do that. Well, can't you tell him? Well, I'm going to have to, I'm afraid. But I know Norm. At the moment, he's very discouraged. He didn't seem discouraged. Oh, believe me, he is. At the moment, he needs his ego boosted. <laughs> well, I'm late for a meeting. Would you stay with this for a while and see if you can come up with any ideas? Me? Well, you're <laughs> a student. Think of our student audience and how we can present this interview so that they understand exactly what Dr. Canavy says. Okay, hey, I'll try. Good. When you come up with something, or if I do, then I'll talk to Norman about alterations. That's fine, Fred, right on target. And it's not going to be very hard to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious, why do you want uh, such a simple graphic? Well, because the concept itself is so basic. Writing requires three elements, a writer, a subject, and a reader. <laughs> That's plain. <laughs> <laughs> if you were writing a diary or a journal, say, your comments, even your choice of words, would be just for yourself. Well, that makes sense. But if you were trying to explain how to mix a certain color of paint... Uh -huh, I'd have to be very careful to choose just the exact words. Uh -huh. The focus would be on the subject, on the facts. Now, if you were trying to sell paint in an ad... Uh, I'd have to consider the audience and how to communicate with mm -hmm. them. And motivate them. Hi, Jenny, Fred. I'm sorry I'm late. Hi, oh, hi, Gwen. Fred is part of the triangle graphic. Oh, good. Now, look, I'm very happy to finish this graphic, but it seems so basic. Are you sure that your students need to be reminded of something as simple as this? Oh, you'd be surprised, Fred. You'd be surprised. Hi, Norman. Don't let my shining presence interrupt. Oh, good morning, Fred. <laughs> Norm. <laughs> they taking advantage of you again? Yeah, uh, drawing triangles. Communication triangles. Now we just need to find a way to use it in the script effectively. Uh, don't worry. I've solved that problem for you, Gwen. I worked up a preliminary outline last night. Oh, it looks as if you've been busy, Norm. Well, once I was sure of the opening, everything else just seemed to fall into place. Anybody want coffee? Fred? Mm. Oh, no thanks. I have to get back to the art department. Well, Excuse thanks, me. Fred. 
If you have any more questions, we'll be right here. Okay, extension 512. Yeah. Right. Fred, Norm. Norm, I see you still plan to open with the Canadian interview. Well, you said he was the authority, so we open up right with him first. Well, I don't have any argument about that, Norm, but I do feel that we need to lay some groundwork before just popping into the middle of an interview. But that would kill what I want to do. Well, perhaps that's what I don't understand. What do you want to do? It's simple. Create some suspense. Build a few questions in the opening, and then spring the answers on them later on. We did it a lot in advertising. But we're not writing advertising, Norm. Trust Our purpose... me, Gwen, it's going to work. Look, ask Jenny. Jenny, what do you think of my outline? Well, <laughs> I haven't had any time to think about it yet. Okay, look, we plan to go through the material this morning, right? Just give my approach a chance. I know you'll like it. All right. All right, we'll, we'll use the outline as a guide. It's fine with me. The next thing is this segment of the Canavy interview. Norm, I like what Canavy says about a clear purpose saving a writer time and effort. But don't you think it needs an introduction? I agree. What kind of introduction? Well, some kind of background, an explanation of Canavy's viewpoint. That he's building his concept around four major aims or purposes, and that one of those purposes is expository writing, and that the purpose of expository writing is to explain and inform. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that after I play the tape. All right, go ahead. I think, and many people think, that the most important thing that you have to consider when you're doing a piece of writing is why are you doing this piece of writing? Now, it's true. In a classroom, you do a piece of paper because it's an assignment, but that's artificial. Ultimately, you're going to write for your career or for another professor or something, and that's not artificial. And the ways in which you organize your thoughts, the ways, the kind of style you write and everything is determined by your purpose. Let me give just a quick example. Supposing an advertiser wants to advertise something on a billboard or in a magazine article. He has at his disposal a certain amount of space and a certain amount of time in effect. He probably will use rather emotional words to get the attention of the audience. He has to limit his words very closely. He has only a certain number of words he can use. That's a persuasive kind of writing. On the other hand, if he is asked to do an expository piece about something for an executive in a firm, and he turns it in with incomplete sentences, fragmentary sentences, or he turns it in with emotionally loaded words, with himself being talked about and the audience being addressed as you, it's totally inappropriate to that purpose. And so a person writing has to say, what am I trying to do? And given the fact that I'm writing for this purpose and this particular audience, I have to take certain techniques, certain styles, certain Would you stop the tape right there, please, Norm? Why there? Because I want to say something about something that's coming up now. Jenny, would you make a note in the outline, something that will introduce Canavy's ideas on how purpose affects the organization and style of a piece of writing? No, hold it. Mm -mm, look here. First we play the interview, then we follow it with an explanation. Yeah, Norm, but for our purposes, that's backwards. Our purposes? Uh -huh. Yes, our underlying purpose is to deliver information, to explain Canavy's ideas to the students. Okay, we'll see if this does that for you. Matter of fact certain virtues of one kind of writing are vices in another kind of writing. Let me give an example. In expository and scientific writing, your words ought to mean pretty carefully the one thing that you're talking about. But on the other hand, in persuasive writing, and very often in literary writing, for poets especially, a word ought to be, and often is, deliberately ambiguous. So that ambiguity is a virtue in expository writing, and it's a vice. No, it's a, ambiguity is a vice in expository writing, but a virtue in much persuasive and literary writing. Emotions are the same way. Emotions in scientific writing are looked upon, done upon, frowned upon. Whereas emotions in persuasive writing and literary writing are very important. So. The criteria for one kind of writing are very different from the criteria for another kind of writing. Well, it seems to me that makes a good introduction to purpose. Yes, but I still don't... ...purposes and aims in my newspaper to illustrate it, and so did I to illustrate what he says. Let's say our aims are expository. All right. By expository, I mean informational or proving something. Most of the major news stories... 
All right. By expository, I mean informational or proving something. Most of the major news stories are going to be expository in that sense. They are. It's in fact an organized pattern. That's even the writers. Persuasive. I take a look at an editorial. And that's a high class, if you wish, type of persuasion. It's a more expository persuasion. Another type of persuasion will be the many ads that I see in the newspaper. The newspapers filled with ads, emotional language and so on. That's persuasion. Literary, I take a look at the comics. There we have a literary use of language in every newspaper, and it's there. It's a humble literary use of language. It's not a noble epic, but there it is. And finally, for expression, I normally take a look at the letters to the editor. And normally, I'll find people who are sounding off about something that has happened. They may move into the expository or the persuasive, too, but very often they're just blowing off steam. That's an expressive use of language. It occurs in every newspaper. But very often they're just blowing off steam. That's an expressive use of language. It occurs in every newspaper. It never fails. Next subject, audience. Just so a minute, Norman. Now, I know you put a lot of work into this outline. Well, there's no need for thanks, But Gwen. the problem is... The problem is it doesn't work. Oh, so that's what you think. Okay, okay, Jenny, I understand where you're coming from. You do? Well, sure. Up until now, you've only seen parts of the script. And you want to make sure that I've covered all the bases. So, check this out. There's one for both of you. What is this? It's the skit, the one I told you about, completely done. And I promise you're going to love it. Well, what's it about? Oh, it's a dramatic scene in which a writer, working alone, is confronted suddenly by his audience. But to tell you the truth, I wrote an ad something like this once. An ad? Yeah. A guy was confronted by his blocked nasal passages. <laughs> <laughs> Sold a lot of nose spray. But, Norm, we're not... Jenny, sorry. just a minute, please. Uh, I don't know about the two of you, but I could use some lunch. Yeah, but I was going to act this part out for the two of you. Don't you want to see it? Yes, but I'm afraid I'm going to be in the studio most of the afternoon, so... Why don't we all look at the skit later on, and then tomorrow morning we'll take the script up from the beginning. Tomorrow? Hi, Cassie. Hi. Hope I'm not interrupting anything. No, no, no. We're just breaking for lunch. Hey, hey, hey Cassie. Since you're not going to lunch, how would you like to see my skit? Oh, I can't, Norm. I've got to go to class. Oh, well, uh, I guess you'll have to see it tomorrow, like everybody else. Yeah, guess so. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwen? Mm -hmm. I have an idea. An idea? Yeah, about the opening. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Well, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Listen, in the morning when you come in, will you please bring in the essay you mentioned to me, the one you wrote last semester? You still want to see it? Yes, I do. Well, it's not exactly an A essay. Well, that's why I want to see it. So tomorrow morning? Okay. And Jenny, you and I will talk this afternoon? Oh, yeah, this afternoon. I think I need a cup of coffee. Do you like one? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'd love some. So, what do you think? Think? Norman Skit. Oh. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't think it works very well. I mean, there are some good points. We see the writer suddenly confront the reader the way all writers have to if they want to succeed. Clever idea. It has a strong message. It tells students how to grasp who the audience is, even when they're writing to an unknown audience. Now, that's what's right with it. But listen to some of this phrasing. There's a cure for your writing problems. And here, think smart and listen. The audience is someone you, the audience is someone you are trying to touch. And this closing phrase, the answer is the audience. It's catchy. Good writing. Well, yeah, it's a slogan or something, but it's off target for our purposes. I'm not saying Norm is writing TV commercials or anything, but there is a pattern in what he's been coming up with. Exactly. Persuasion. It's a good piece of persuasive writing. And you know, I think he's writing for a persuasive purpose mm -hmm. out of habit. And that's the problem. He's saying why a student should consider the purpose of a piece of writing without showing the difference it makes. How do you think we can make it clear to him? Well... Maybe we could take his idea, rewrite it with an expository purpose, and show him the difference. Well, let's give it a try. Let's do. Oh, 
Morning. Am I late? Good morning, Cassie. No, you're not late. Thanks for coming in early. Oh, I don't mind. Besides, I'm anxious to see what you're going to say about this. Truth is, I kind of hate to show it to you. Oh, come on. You're talking to a veteran teacher here. I've seen some of everything in student essays. Oh, and I think you said you had an idea about the opening? Oh, uh, yeah. Now, it's not spectacular, but... But uh, I'm interested and I want to discuss it. Okay. But first, why don't we read your essay? And by the time we've finished, maybe Jenny will be here. All right. What about Norm? He's usually early. No, no. He has a, a meeting with Fred this morning. Let's see what we have here. Unacceptable. That's pretty plain. Yeah. Cruel and unreasonable, I thought. Uh, and I worked hard on that. Well, the imagery in Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats. Oh, it's one of my favorite poems. A poem I think I really know well. Mm -hmm. And you tell me the assignment was what? To uh, to analyze? Yeah. Unacceptable. You know, I think he wrote that on there to humiliate me. Oh, to remind you. Sis, you were asked to analyze Keats' use of imagery in this poem. Well, that's what I did. See what you think. All right. Ode on a Grecian Urn is not only one of John Keats' most quoted poems, but a poem that helped me understand the enduring importance of a work of art in our world. I cannot read the famous closing lines without being moved. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That's all ye know in life and all ye need to know. Those two lines sum up for me the essence of great art. Hmm. Oh, yes, Cassie, this is wonderful. It is? Yes, and you've also made the classic mistake students make time and time again. Mistake? You were given an assignment with one purpose, simply to analyze, correct? Yeah, I guess that's right. Mm -hmm. And you got carried away giving personal opinions rather than describing the imagery. Now, this is generally well written. It's just off the mark. Well, I have opinions. Aren't they important? Oh, yes, but that wasn't your assignment. Now, I want you to listen to this tape by Dr. Kennedy, and then we'll come back and we'll reread the essay. Here he talks about purpose in college writing. Uh, I've talked before different college groups, before people in many departments, for instance at Beaver College, and they found that the single most important thing to tell their students was, now I'm asking you for an expository piece of writing. Now that's going to rule out an awful lot of personal self-expression. It's going to rule out trying to be cute as you would in a poem or something like that. It's even going to rule out loaded words and giving one side of the story and so on. And to know these basic distinctions is to enable a beginning writer, especially to make all kind, to avoid all kinds of mistakes. That's very important. As a matter of fact, I think most of my freshmen find that that's a very useful thing. What can happen, what can really spoil a piece of writing is to drag different kinds of purposes in and the whole thing is cloudy and ineffectual. Well, are you saying my essay is cloudy and... Um, ineffectual? Well, it's true of any essay that doesn't follow a clear purpose. But I, I, I do describe the imagery. Listen. Uh, here. Keats' poem is built of images that he sees drawn on the ancient urn. The fair youth beneath the tree in the second stanza could be the poet himself. All right, fine. But then, look, you go on to express personal emotions again. A poet that I've found to be one of the most enjoyable to read of all those in the Romantic period. Now, those are personal comments attached to description, and they make your thoughts seem cloudy. Well, what should I have done? Well, let's look at the opening again. Rather than express your personal opinion about Keats, make a clear statement about the imagery in his poem. Well, the whole poem is kind of based on imagery, uh, the images on the urn. Well, then say that. Okay. John Keats has structured the poem on the visual images. No, no. <laughs> the images drawn upon the urn by the ancient Grecian potter. Mm -hmm. Now, what are those images? Well, there's a whole world there. Uh, trees. Uh, a youth playing a musical instrument, a village scene, 
two lovers about to kiss. So explain your ideas about the imagery. Now, your purpose was to analyze, right? Uh -huh. Remember what Canavy just said? Uh, having an expository piece of writing rules out a lot of personal expression. So you mean a clearer sense of purpose would have kept me on track and prevented a lot of wasted effort. Exactly. Guess who was just pulling into the parking lot right behind me? Norman. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, don't worry. He's meeting with Fred to discuss a set this morning. Oh, good. Then we'll have time to go over this. Oh, good. We'll skip. Jenny and I revised it last night. Just finished every word of it. Hi, Kathy. Hi, and Norm doesn't know about it? He hasn't the slightest idea. So let's go over this quickly, and Cassie, please tell us what you think. Uh, what's it about? The subject is writing for an unknown audience. Unknown? Well, not completely. Often when you write, you know exactly who the reader is going to be. For example, say you were writing a letter to a banker about a loan. Before you start writing, you should stop and think. What bankers stop and think? What bankers are like? What information do they need? And you'd ask yourself some questions. How educated are they? How much do they know about my needs? What kind of information do they require? You know, things that would give you a picture of your reader. And that would influence the way I write. Yes, and you should do it with every audience, whether it's a banker or a customer or a friend or yes, whoever. Yes, the, the subject here in this skit is writing to a more general audience. It's essentially an unknown. It'll only take a second, friend, but all you've got to do, old pal, is just give us your honest opinion. Hello, Norm. <sighs> good morning, good morning. I thought you were meeting in Fred's office this morning. So did I. Sure, talk about the set, but first I wanted to run through the skit for him. What, right here, this, this morning? Mm -hmm, give him a little taste of it. Uh, no, this isn't my idea. Besides, Fred's not biased about this, and I want to show you that I can convince him that a writer needs to consider even an unknown audience. So, if everybody's no, ready... Norman, please! Sit down, please. Just take a second, but I know you'll love it. Love it. <laughs> what? Norman, you said something now that I need to correct. I mean, discuss. I did? Yes, you said convince. You said that you were going to convince Fred. Oh, no, no, not me. The skit will. No, I'm afraid that won't either. You see, there's a basic problem here. Well, let me put it another way. Lately, the things that you've been writing have been wonderful, well-written. Yes, well-written for what they are. Attempts to convince and persuade students, points in a lesson. Mm, so, what's wrong with that? Well, for advertising or an editorial in a paper, nothing. But... For our program, you're starting with the wrong purpose. Do you mind if we show you what we mean? D do you mind, Fred? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'd like to see it. Um, I haven't seen it either. Now, we've taken your idea, Norm, but... <sighs> Gwen and I have revised it with an expository purpose. I'm glad I'm sitting down. Uh, Fred, Fred and Cassie can act as a purely unbiased audience, all right? That's my skit? Don't worry, you'll recognize it. Let's see now, where did we decide to start? Exactly the way Norm did. A writer, that's you, is working alone and having a terrible time of it. All right, then out of the night, a mysterious stranger. She wears a trench coat and a fedora hat. <laughs> that's me. So, after getting over this initial shock, the writer learns that this mysterious person is his audience sent to help him out. <laughs> Jenny? Okay, now the audience is speaking. As I said, I'm here to thank you, by the way. Boy, have problems. What do you mean? Well, you're talking to yourself, not to me. The audience for this paper happens to be unknown. Unknown, my eye. You're still trying to communicate a message to a reader, aren't you? I suppose. Then you've got to start by considering me, your reader. First, ask yourself some questions that'll give you some basic facts. Is this for kids? Adults. Educated people? Mm, I'd say intelligent. Do they like to be bored? Of educated people? Mm, I'd say intelligent. Do they like to be bored? Of course not. Are they already interested in the subject? Well, I, I guess I have to make them interested. Okay, there's a start. Now you've got a general picture of the audience. It's not completely unknown anymore. <laughs> and now we go on to give an example showing that a writer's focus on the audience improves a piece of writing. And in your version, your basic purpose was clearly to persuade. But students don't need to be persuaded, they need to understand. Mm -hmm. Norm, getting a clear focus on why you're doing a piece of writing is basic, but you've been writing for so long now, you don't think about it consciously anymore. Of course, we have an expository purpose. We're not trying to sell anything here. And we should show that it doesn't matter how good the writing is, if it's off the mark, it's off the mark. Well, ha <laughs> ha! 
You see what I mean, Fred? Yep. It's plain to me. Mm -hmm. How about you, Cassie? Ah, uh, yeah, I understand. But... Uh, but what? What about audience? Well, as we tried to explain in the skit, you've got to consider your audience from the very beginning and purpose. <clears throat> yes, and uh, the two of them together help you make some basic decisions on how to approach a right task. Well, I asked that because I was thinking about the opening. The opening? The opening you developed in your outline for this script. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, what I thought was uh, the interview that you wanted to use would work a lot better, um, at least for the audience, uh, at the close of the script. The close? Yeah. See, by then the students will understand the terms, and they'll see what Dr. Navy means when he talks about uh, purpose-solving problems, uh, the point he makes in the interview. The close, huh? Okay. Let's think about this for the close, then. You want to play, Jenny? Yeah. <laughs> the problems of writing are innumerable. There are thousands of problems. There are grammatical problems, there are vocabulary problems, and so on. But the two most important problems, I think, are problems of determining what you're trying to do and problems of determining what attitude you're going to take toward your subject matter. Now, if you say that those are the two most important ones and a lot of other things will fall in line after those are determined, then in effect you've solved beforehand many of the problems that look insuperable. And consequently, by isolating particular problems of expository versus persuasive versus literary and versus expressive writing, many, many of the vocabulary and syntax just fall into place. They have to. Because... You know I like... ...syntax just fall into place. They have to. Because... You know I like that for the clothes. It's really good. Hey, hey, I just got this great idea for the middle of the program. You're going to love it. Wait till you hear this.